What's up, folks? This is the October 2022 monthly market update where we go over different articles that I think are pertinent to real estate investors out there and probably other investors out there. Welcome, everybody. This is the monthly market update. Here we go. But if you haven't yet, check out my book, The Journey to Simple Passive Cash Flow, Passive Real Estate for the Working Professional. This is available on Kindle and there's the audiobook version. If you guys want to check out the YouTube version for free, you can go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash book. But uh, currently up to like hundred reviews, I think. So that's cool. So at least a hundred people read it, maybe more. If you guys are listening to this on iTunes, also check it out on the YouTube channel where you can check out all these cool slides that we have prepared for you guys. And then a lot of, a lot of these articles have great graphs and visuals along with it. But uh, first thing off, Starbucks plans to open 2,000 new stores by 2025, invest 450 million in existing locations. I think there's a lot of talk of recessions, but I think you're going to see a lot of the big players who have the capital to reinvest in potentially rough times ahead, or they could be some of the best times to invest ahead. All this is happening while they're also applying to expand their mobile ordering offerings via the company's app. So even with that, they're still planning to expand real estate locations. Wallet Hub reports the 2022 safest cities in America. At the top of the list is Columbia, Maryland, uh, Nashua, North ha New Hampshire, Laredo, Texas, Portland, Maine, Warwick, Rhode Island, Yonkers, New York, Gilbert, Arizona. Huh, I didn't know Gilbert was that safe. Burlington, I think it's Virginia, Raleigh, North Carolina, Lewistown, Maine. Um, for some of you guys who are curious, Honolulu, Hawaii is in the 75. And then some of the worst ones, LA, Chattanooga, Jackson, Mississippi, Oakland, Oklahoma City, Memphis, Baton Rouge, Detroit, San Bernardino, Fort Lauderdale, St. Louis. Also on the same list, law enforcement employees per capita. Some of the top ones are Washington, D.C., New York, New Jersey, St. Louis, Chicago. The fewest ones are Fontana, California, Montedeso, California, Fremont, California, Irvine, California, Trula Vista, California. Fewest traffic fatalities, and it's not too important. You guys can check out that on the, the channel later. So this is the a little visual of the U.S. 30-year fix, just to take that one data point. And these are all the month-to-month -month changes in the, the interest rates, basically. So what you're seeing now is you're seeing as of like quarter one of this year, the Fed has been raising interest rates pretty greatly. If this is all new to you, check out the podcast I did with Richard Duncan at simplepassivecashflow.com slash Duncan. We'll tell you all about how that supply chain, unemployment, your war in Ukraine and COVID crisis in China all is related. And I think after you watch that podcast slash video, I think it's going to make you a lot more comfortable with what's happening out there. The way I look at these kind of charts is you see the uptick right now. And in these upticks, they typically play themselves out a year and that's why I tell people like, 18 months from now, we should see the capital market start to open up. And my prediction is we start to head off to the races again. That is if, you know, the raising of the interest rates uh, is able to increase unemployment just slightly. So we avoid a hard landing and do a soft landing recession. But you can see how in few times in history, like the 1980s, where the interest rates skyrocketed a lot more than it did now. Some people I talk to, and this is more of an extreme point of view, think that the interest rates may need to get up to 8 to 10%. We're not there yet. How much more does the interest rates need to get pushed up so that unemployment comes back up? And unfortunately, home prices are going to go down a little bit just because people aren't going to be able to get their affordability up to afford more via loans, um, but that's just a byproduct. Again, what we're looking at is that unemployment to come up and for us to correct. And this is also the same thing, It's but it's visualizing the interest rates in a little bit different fashion here. And we're seeing this increase in 2022, the interest rates, and you see how it compares to the 2015 to 2018 climb, which was a lot longer and a lot more gradual. And then you see the nine. The 99, 2001, and then the big one, um, and I think the big one was like the 1980s there. 
So all this has been happened before, and this is the one of the major levers that the Fed pulls to keep inflation at bay. So this article is talking about the rise of all of renters. Now a lot of millennial renters are giving up ownership. Why? Because the prices of homes have gotten away from them, even though they may be coming down. But affordability due to the interest rates is allowing them to qualify for less. Now, we don't have any news if Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac are going to make things easier for borrowers to qualify for more. But this the study done here by Apartment List is suggesting that more and more millennials are just giving up and just saying, screw it, we're just going to be renters. And it's gone up from averaging around the 20% range and now up to 24.7%. Of course, this is all survey data. So, you know, you who know survey data is always there's a, a level of fudge factor in there but i think that's why we all are investors and we understand that the lower middle class or at least the folks that are captured in this study which are the younger people not yet to their family formation years and they haven't amassed wealth yet or down payments for properties um it just makes more sense for them to rent. And this kind of coincides with a more mobile workforce with people having to move around a lot for their jobs, especially because you're not going to be working at your job for the rest of your life. You're going to probably skip around and jump around to different employers. Why are they saying that they're not going to buy a house and instead rent forever? The biggest thing here is they just can't afford it, which is 77% of their participants said that. Now, this is the... Next excuse, or if you want to call it excuses, I like the flexibility that renting provides. That has that response has gone down slightly over the last few years. And then also I prefer to avoid home maintenance and other additional costs. And other people think I think buying a home is financially risky. And I would say for most young people who are good at saving their money, I think that buying a home is a bad thing to do. Although most people fall in the category of they're bad with their money and they need a forced piggy bank, at that point, I think buying a house makes more sense. So if you're confused by that and you're a good saver, you know, that's how you say, join our club, check out my article about buying a house to live in. Is it the right thing for you? Do you, which side of this paradigm do you fall in with the common guy who should buy a house or the people in our group who are getting on the offense and buying assets and instead foregoing on buying that lovely primary house with the white picket fence. I still rent, by the way, for what it's worth. I practice what I preach for now. At some point, I'll probably want to just enjoy life and spend my money for once. Also reports from Zumper, occupancy rates and the pace of rent increases are now falling in major metros as the renter demand softens with fear of recession kicks in with many renters deciding to stay put or trade down on most expensive option. And I think this is We've had a quite a big of a run up, right? Some markets such as Phoenix, the rents were going up like 10 to 20% every year. Uh, I know we just got back from Alabama where we had one property in particular where we had a lot of legacy tenants and we were rehabbing properties and we made the decision. It's finally time after two years of ownership that it's really time to bump up the rents up 25%. And a lot of them are taking it. Every market is different, right? That's why when you look at these national rent growth statistics, you have to take it for with a grain of salt. But I would agree that in some markets, you know, this there people have this in the back of their head that perhaps a recession is looming, as if that's always the case, right? Never know. But maybe me people are using that as a means that instead of springing for that sixteen hundred dollar luxury apartment, just going for the $1,300 one that makes sense, which they should, I think. <laughs> also, maybe you can uh, contribute this to the interest rates going up, but seller sentiment is decreasing with more inventory coming online and sales taking longer to complete. Yet, I think you're still seeing a lot of me major metros with a days under market of under 100, which is that two to three months that's considered a seller's market at that point because you don't have that much inventory. But we're still, a lot of places are still below that. And therefore, or I don't know if er, therefore, or as a result, we, there's a general housing shortage, especially in some particular markets, the growth states, their emerging markets, as we call it. Um, also, millennials today are in their prime home buying years. The millennials are now 25 to 40. Man, how have they grown? According to the definition we use here as such, 
their home ownership rate has increased faster than any other generation over the past decade. So although we're just talking about how they are going to stay renters forever, the ones who are buying very quickly, a lot quicker than other generations prior to, and maybe you can contribute to that to the fact that in the Great Recession 2008-2010 era, that they just absolutely got beat up. And it's taken them well over a decade, almost a couple of decades to recover. And the last five years, they've greatly picked up the home buying. So this would be a great, if you guys were to come back to the YouTube channel, if you're listening on, and we also put this on the podcast too, for you guys who you like to drive in the car and listen. I tried to describe these pictures as best as possible. This is probably one that you guys want to check out on the YouTube channel, but it's kind of interesting if it has this, the lines of the silent generation, the baby boomers, Gen X, and they show the percent of home ownership rates. Um, baby boomers have finally caught up with the silent generation. Maybe the silent generation is maybe no longer <laughs> or, or statistically gone already. Like they're about that age already past the age of 80 not many of them are around it anymore uh, the baby boomers are potentially in the same clump with the silent generation the gen x are sitting at 69 percent baby boomers and silent generation are about 78 percent home ownership where the millennials at 48 percent and climbing what is the big issue with millennials renters not having down payment savings two-thirds of prospective millennial home burners have no zero down have zero down payment savings survey in 2022 said that 60, 60 percent do not have any dedicated down payment savings and only 16 percent have saved over ten thousand dollars huh that's pathetic but hey that's what this national data is right a lot of you guys listening to these types of podcasts at least are investor based most of you guys are credit investors making over six figures and most of you guys uh, let's say if you make as a household 300,000, I typically see you guys saving 50 grand at least a year. So you guys are definitely not the focus group captured in this pie chart. But, and I tell you that because number one, you take this data for a grain of salt. It's not you particular driving in your car to your pool job. And it's it maybe an appreciation too, right? Because if you're listening to this and you have the time, you're doing pretty good for yourself but you can do better, right? And that's why we are further continuing along this financial independent journey together. If And if that's the case, join our club, simplepassivecashflow.com slash club, and let's get to know each other a little bit better. We give everybody a free introduction call with myself. I can usually pretty quickly ascertain what the heck is going on and give you some pointers. I'm not fucking you financial advice because I'm not here to sell you some nonsense fin financial securities, such as stock market stuff, but I'm just... I think it's good that when I talk to people, it's not often that they get to size themselves up with people, their constituents, such as our group. A lot of you guys are the people who max out your 401ks, make good salaries, maybe even be the, the best person in your family financially, let alone your friend group. And it's, it's nice to compare yourself with people who are also financially minded. That said, you keep doing that too much, you start to get really depressed, and sometimes it's good to compare down. But no, I, I think this is why it's good for, if you guys have never made it out to a retreat, we always allow you guys to come to the one of these events at least once to test drive our organization. Make sure you're part of the club because the uh, the retreat event page is, gonna, is almost done, and we've got a hotel pick for Waikiki. So we're going to be releasing that and then ticket sales are going to be going up starting here in the next month. So be on the lookout for that. A uh, U.S. apartment construction on track to reach 50 year high in 2022. This is interesting, right? Supposedly we're in a recession right now, or maybe some people have doom and gloom, but, or is that just the, the unsophisticated investors out there? Because the institutional smart money, the developers, they are building like crazy right now. And part of that is the obvious fundamental shortage in housing. Like New York developers have upped their game and the Metro is projected to see the highest number of units this year, surpassing Dallas Fort Worth Metro for the first time in 2000. And this is despite headwinds related to labor shortfalls, material costs and availability and supply chain issues. This is that first article in a many that I'm going to show where the professionals, the institutions are 
in a way, kind of doubling down, as you saw Starbucks did, as we mentioned at the top of the call. So where are they building? I'm just going to read up from the top to the bottom. New York, Dallas, Miami, Austin, Houston, Texas, Phoenix, Arizona. Ooh, that one's a little small. I can't see it. Atlanta, Georgia, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, Orlando, Denver, Nashville, Raleigh, Charlotte, Chicago, Portland, San Francisco, Twin Cities. So those are the year from the top to bottom. Top 20 metros for our cup apartment construction in 2022. John Burns, uh, he released this great infographic on the top 10 signs of a market bubble. Some things that we're not seeing that normally would be indicative of a market bubble is very high supply. We have very low supply right now. Days in the market in most places are under 100 days. And so that's not happening. Other things, luxury cars for the staff, um, when you start to see strippers buying, <laughs> just using a reference from that big short movie, but when you start to see regular blue collar folks, jobs, buying luxury cars, that's the time to scratch your head. And that's not happening. The other thing that's not happening is creative mortgages, right? Like after 2008, the federal government got involved and built a lot of fail safes in there. And then the last thing, the mortgage defaults and arms, we don't have that anymore, or at least it's not as prevalent. And that is one of the, some of the things that are not happening that are indicative of a housing bubble. There are some other things, and which is why I think we have already been in a recession for the last couple of quarters, but the industry publications I read are saying we're going to be in this state in the next year. I think it's going to be more like 18 months, but 2024, we should be off and running. And I think it's a mistake to wait, but just change your type of investing, right? Don't go after these kinds of deals where there's no equity or collateral, right? So what am I talking about? Maybe like in crypto or altcoin or ATM mining stuff, unless it's with an industry leader or somebody with an unfair advantage, those are the type of businesses that don't really have any collateral behind them which is why I still like investing in real estate. Now, if you really want to be uber conservative, investing in real estate world is pretty conservative, but maybe stay away from some of the more heavier value add type of stuff and stick to more on the debt side or stabilize yield plays. So Hurricane Ian impacted the Florida's apartment market. What's the impact from that? Expect demand from vacant units from displaced homeowners, That'll probably likely reverse a 2022 trend of declining occupancy rates across Florida. I don't have any properties in Florida anymore. I had a deal in Puta Gorda that luckily sold, although that's what you got insurance for. But, you know, I had some properties in the Gulf that we sold prior to this. And it's a, I think this hurricane, like an insurance broker told us that, man, if there's one more major storm, it comes through, I don't know, who knows what the insurance rates are going to be. I can say on a few deals that we had insurance costs went up like three folds from what it originally was. Um, and then who knows what this is going to be. My thinking is that the insurance rates can be so high or uninsurable that the federal government is going to have to get in and help back so people can buy insurance so people can live there. But we'll see how that plays out. But for now, uh, hopefully that Tampa area recovers pretty quickly. This commercial property executive article continues with this catastrophic loss impact to insurance and reinsurance cares. Cares would be firmer in the requirement for increases and pressure on the magnitude of their thought process. Retail and restaurants are probably the most vulnerable, but maybe not the most expensive. A lot of companies, especially in Florida, do plan to, for catastrophic and for more expense, it would be to replace their equipment than more seriously, they take it already. Florida was already seeing challenges in terms of securing capacity, high construction costs, and supply chain issues. Hurricane Ian has the potential to exasperate these market issues while making insurance difficult to find and maintain. And I would personally add on with seeing what the premiums increase this next go around. Um, so one trend that's happening, multifamily developers are turning some dead space office into apartments. We've got involved in that as a group too. Just know that these are some of the most uh, difficult from an engineering perspective because you're tying into existing systems where if it were me in future developments, I would just prefer to just start off with what we call the greenfield, right? Where we have a just a, a flat barren land 
we finished the Chase Creek apartments. We were out there last week. We have move-ins now. Yay. It looks amazing. It's a lot better than what I thought it was going to be. We initially came up with the idea and man, did that project come together so quickly. I believe summer of 2021 were when the, the concrete pads were getting installed and it didn't take much more than a few months for the frames to get constructed and then it to start to look like apartment complexes. So we've got 230 units out there in Huntsville, Alabama. And the plan is to do more. And if you guys want to jump on the next deal, get to know us and join the club. Jim Costello, Chief Economist at MSCI Real Estate says the key issue people do not understand is just how difficult and expensive these conversions can be. And I think that's what I mentioned earlier. So here's a trend that I've been tipping my investors off, especially those who joined the club um, with the difficulties in the capital markets. We were seeing Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac get a lot less aggressive on lending and giving out worse terms back in March and April. And now we're starting to see some of the secondary lenders, community banks, et cetera, do the same. Graystar, which is traditionally one of the bigger operators out there, they're starting to offer financing to multifamily borrowers because of this need, right? As big players pull out, there is a demand and folks like Graystar are filling that void with obviously higher rates because that's what the going rate is. But this is also why we've switched um, our mindset and our acquisition strategy. And that's why we're really not doing deals anymore. I really don't know how people are making these deals pencil these days with interest rates where they are and because they can't get really good lending. And this is where we are starting to fund deals as a lender. Um, because it is a lot more secure, especially in uncertain times in head, but still, still you got to outpace inflation, right? And we have to still remain active in a way we're copying what Graystar is doing here. The good news though, is multifamily fundamentals remain strong. And a lot of people, um, expect loan demand to bounce back, bounce back next year. Multifamily remains a favorite investment class and has continued to perform well. Another, this is more for the advanced investors out there, but commercial property executor is commenting on the benefits of in interest rate caps at this time like this. So interest rates caps are most times people are doing bridge loans these days. And the bad thing about the bridge loans is the rate can potentially jump up on you. Of course, if you're doing value add, it's not a huge deal because you're generating so much force appreciation and you're always going to be, you should be in theory over water or above water. But one way you can mitigate that is doing a interest rate cap. So your interest rates can't go above say a percent or two. It is costly though. And though the Fed's policy of raising the Fed's funds rate and quantitative tightening to help with inflation should eventually provide builders some relief. It's no wonder that in recent months, borrowers who plan to start construction projects have been asking their debt capital sources for fixed rate notes. But in a way, there's like an insurance policy or hedging. You pay a little money for that, that rate cap. Well, right now they're really expensive because everybody and their mother knows that interest rates are likely to go up several times at a half a point, three quarter point intervals. And this is where I, I'm speculating we get in the 8 to 10% range for just regular 30-year mortgages for people. And then it'll go back down. But this is where these rate caps are extremely expensive for folks, for operators. But here you're seeing you can buy different term lengths and then the cost of doing them. For those people who buy options and calls and things like this type of chart will look very familiar to you guys. But... That's in the financial world, it's a lot of, you know, kind of these charts and in a way you're just gambling at what's happening in the future and you're pricing in risk. RE Business Online is talking about battle over rent control. So municipalities in New York and California, these more blue states have taken steps towards enacting further rent control with states such as Nevada are shooting them down entirely. These are the battleground uh, states to watch if you're a landlord. Only five states, California, Maryland, New Jersey, New York, Oregon, and, and Minnesota, and D.C. have rent control laws in place. 31 states have preemptives that prevent rent control policies, including Florida, whose law bans local governments from controlling the price of rent in certain cases. As one California and New York 
probably lead the, the nation. They follow each other as a group. So the, to me, as an investor, it's always good to have one eye on this. But if you're one of those people who gets stressed out and freaked out about all this type of stuff, don't worry about it. Just diversify your portfolio and try and stay one step ahead of the curve and invest in the states that aren't going to go down this road. There is an article here that kind of talked about the ground looks shaky. The safe thing is to do is to build multifamily assets. Um, and this is the approach that we're personally taking as we start to pick up more parcels of 20 to 50 acre pieces of land. If you guys have any, let us know. We'll buy it from you because there is a, it's a very safe play. If you can structure your contracts and you have the, the educated personnel and experience to take a dry piece of land or entitled piece of land and turn it into the highest and greatest use, which could be a class A apartment. Of course, workforce housing is a sector we still like to stay in. You have a lot of room for margin. I think the numbers on the last one we just built, like 180 grand with all hard and soft costs. 180 grand per unit. We should be able to sell it for at least 250 here in a bit. So you're talking a huge profit margin right there. And what I'm learning is that sophisticated investors, they don't really care about the cash flow along the, every month or every quarter because they have a bigger balance sheet, higher net worth or jobs. But what they care about is security and making bigger wax of equity. And that's what the developments come in. So we're going to be focusing more and more on this. So if you guys want the inside scoop on this, make sure you guys are part of the club and you completed your onboarding protocols, call with myself, etc. And first step, go to simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. The Congress passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which everybody joked and muttered that, yeah, how the hell can you create an Inflation Reduction Act when you're spending billions of dollars in the process? But not much from my circle has come ways you can use this. One of the most significant benefits of was the IRA ex uh, is the expansion of the Advanced Energy Project Tax Credit. This allows you to credits up to 30% of the investment per property using qualifying advanced energy project that is certified by the Department of Energy. So what does that mean? I think this is a point where they write it and then they administer some letters down the road. So some of the drawbacks that came out of this Inflation Reduction Act is an enactment of the corporate minimum book tax. Minimum tax would be 15% of book income, which is amount of income showed on the application applicable corporations financial statements fortunately this doesn't really impact individuals like any stimulus check would right but this goes out to the municipalities the states are already providing some economic development incentives for new or expanding manufacturing facilities either in the form of property tax exemptions or income tax credits so some things that are not included in the final edition of the bill are changes to the carried interest requirements that would have had a tremendous negative impact on the multifamily industry so what carried interest is some sponsors general partners who only get paid when passive investors get paid there there's some tax benefits to that it gets taxed at a different rate or like, like the big mutual funds or big big funds out there those leaders get paid off carried interest that has been left off the table and i'm just i'm pointing this out because this is just another thing that they put in there to scare everybody or maybe the republicans put it there to scare the democrats or who knows vice versa but a lot of these things put in there and then when these things are actually written, most of these concerns just fall off the map. What was the last one earlier this year was they were going to threaten everybody's self-directed IRAs where you now you had to get this cumbersome type of appraisal done every single time that costed you a fortune. You know, that stuff like that, they put it out there and then they pulled it back at the last revision. So how the Inflation Reduction Act will affect multifamily. Some things that are impacting those of you guys who invest in apartments, the base tax credit, energy efficient commercial buildings deduction. The new energy efficient home credit will now apply to all buildings that meet Energy Star for multifamily new construction programs to 2032. So that's an extension there. Other things, one billion in total grants to help states adopt recent residential commercial building energy codes, 8 million to HUD, to provide grants for loans for affordable housing properties so that i think that helps out a lot of investors here that just means better when the capital markets do open up a little bit that's the money to you know back 
and insure some of these loans. And then just over $3 billion for funding for state and local governments to improve neighborhood access and equity, including infrastructure improvements and anti-displacement policies. I don't know if it was in this program, but I do know that additional funding got released. At least they were talking with our operations folks who sit down with the tenants to help them apply for government assistance, that funnel was back on. Some of the buildings in certain municipalities are, are under the viewpoint of certain judges going through the eviction process. Some, there are people getting those government checks, the government assistance again. So that's good news for us. A uh, multi-housing news says some owner prefer single family rentals. Discovered that one in four owners would live in a rental house if they could find a place that meet their exact needs. In I always question these types of surveys because it's like, sure, they would love to live in a house, but can they afford the damn thing? Just like a lot of our investors, they always say, this happens two or three times a year. I get investors saying, yeah, I'm going to be talking with my tenant in my rental property and they want to own or finance it. So it'd be a great way to not pay taxes and get a good price. And I'm like, I laugh because it's, dude, I've never seen that happen. Every tenant wants to buy the house they live in and none of them have the credit score, let alone $10,000 to the name for a down payment. So you're better off just selling the thing, unlocking the equity, and then putting it into other syndications or buying more rentals. But I'm just telling you, if you guys are listening out there and you have tenants, ain't gonna happen. Just, run their credit score first. Make sure it's at least over 650, 700. If not, it's a pipe dream. But here's what the, uh, the big guys are doing. So when Blackstone, a private equity giant, floated the idea of creating vast portfolios of homes after the global financial crisis, the banks few refused to lend it. One of the firms ran the idea by Sam Zell, a property mobile who sold Blackstone his $39 billion office empire before the financial crisis said no way for a investor routinely spurging on hotel chains and swinky office towers the buy to let business seem like small fight by comparison now you're seeing like a lot of these wall street companies snapping up family homes single family homes just like uh, mom and pop investors but unlike you guys mom and, or mom and pop investors out there who tend to own no more than a handful of homes the biggest institutions hold tens of thousands of these things and offered renovation and probably run these things a lot more tighter ship there's obviously we've seen this before 2009 2012 where these guys would come in and they're not super effective at managing these portfolios they're coming in again and it could be an opportunity for some of you guys to unload some of yours but just know that you know, it's I've always thought like single family homes was like the last frontier that the regular person could buy, get into real estate and transcend themselves to accredited investor status and beyond without having to work at a high paid job for more than a decade. Seems like that, that this little opportunity may be going away. It's sad. It's sad. It's if Sanzel created like a trillion dollar fund to go after the essential oil companies and compete directly head in head with them and all their direct multi-level marketing consultants, essentially the same thing. Don't know why they would do that, but if they did. Uh, Fannie Mae projects modest recession in 2023. The combination of high inflation, monetary policy tightening, and slowing housing market will likely tip the economy in a modest recession next year. I would argue we're already there. As I do believe the second quarter of negative GDP growth, which we had, is a definition of a recession. Uh, Fannie Mae pilots positive only rent payment reporting program. So here's one of the things that I, I uncovered that Fannie Mae is like pseudo government uh, entity. They launched this program to, they're only going to report the payments made so that they can let the credit bureaus know so people can start to improve their credit scores now when they're renting now i don't know what like a non-report of a positive one's got to assume that the dude didn't pay but that's i think this is a as a landlord or a property owner i like this because it gives me some insight into who the heck we are renting to that there's some kind of trend and history there instead of just some random people off the internet or craigslist people you know i joke there but or people coming off the street literally but that's something that they're putting together and they're the reason why they're doing it is they want people to improve their credit scores to eventually buy houses to live or at least the qualified ones south region sees the most pandemic era revenue growth um we've talked about this many times 
the particular metric focuses on rent roll, but does not include amenities or concessions. So it provides a nice apples to apples comparison of revenue performance across regions and markets. The Northeast, again, really outperformed through 2020. In fact, a, in the West region, there was a slight decline. Uh, both the West and the South saw revenue increases of about 10 cents per square foot during 2021. Vox reports rising rent piece prices are keeping inflation high. It's a chicken and egg thing. Is it the rents going up? Is it pay going up? Or is it just general inflation? Either way, it's all going up. The typical U.S. monthly rent was $2,090 in August, up 12.3% from a year before. That is much higher than it was before the pandemic in February 2020. The national average rent was 1660 So economic policymakers closely watch rent prices, not only because consumers spend a big portion of their budgets on housing, but also because the category is a major contributor to inflation. Shelter is a larger component to the CPI, making up 30% of the overall inf inflation. You know, it's messed up about the inflation numbers. Like they don't take into account like oil prices and some other things. You guys can check out like there's a, if you Google this train of thought that I'm having, it's, you're going to probably agree with me, but to me, I don't like how they include like housing. Housing is such a huge thing. Part of they have to, but I almost like to be an industry like like oil and gas like where they you can just increase your prices on people and then it doesn't get captured in the cpi but that's just my side comment there one of the questions that we get a lot and in this article in its title do households flock to bc properties during recessions and bc apartment performance certainly does hold up better than class a in times of economic stress based on the two graphs here showing the sustainably higher rent growth than class A properties, maybe about double that. Not all recessions or economic stress are the same. So the pandemic was very interesting because you had people working from home who are more on the higher end, your white collar workers, your knowledge workers who work from home and ordered Uber Eats, and they were pretty untouched. And where your B and C workers, where your frontline workers, your people who have expendable jobs, where some people went out of business, they cut those jobs. Those are people who struggled the most during the pandemic. So the complete opposite of what would happen in a normal economic stress or recession. But in a typical recession, that's what this happens. And this is why we effectively invest in workforce housing. And this is why I would not really suggest like building a portfolio entirely of short-term rentals, right? Because it's more of a discretionary item. Now we are going to be rolling out. I'm going to be getting involved in some of that type of stuff. So stay tuned. So make sure you guys jump on the, the newsletter email list. Again, like you want to diversify portfolio, but primarily most of my portfolio is in this workforce housing sector. I don't do that much class C these days. I'm not a huge fan of that type of stuff. I still like the class B stuff more. This is from Moody's Analytics, by the way. During the last three recessions, both class A and BC absorption levels declined from their respective cyclical peaks, but class A levels and deltas actually remain relatively stronger than class Bs, which is exactly what I was mentioning. The pandemic hurt the lower end instead of the upper end, which is a little unusual. Now, there's this really cool class cut absorption and rent income that we have on the screen here. You guys can check out later. I'm not going to get into it too much. But the last point here is after a recession's official end, that many households, those have been out of work for a long while or have had to take a job with a reduced hours or incomes have burned through much of their savings and are finally forced to trade down. So there can be quite a bit of a lag. No different than like the leg that we're seeing right now with inflation, right? We've been trying to get that damn thing down, but there's just so much liquidity in the system, right? Because if you go look at the Richard Duncan videos, there's so much fake money pumped into the system that it's going to take a while for that money to vacate for inflation to come down. No different than most people generally have some savings out there. It takes a while, a leg for that to expend out for people to finally say, Oh my God, I got to change. I got to go to a cheaper rent apartment. 
Uh, two straight quarters of negative GDP growth and persistent inflation signal that the U.S. economy is starting down a recession in the near future, if not one in already. Class B and C rent growth has outpaced Class A's through the first half of 2022 and in the first quarter of the year. Class B and C absorption outpaced Class A for the only the second time in the over two decades tracking this data. It's a sign that household budgets are a bit pinched due to inflation, but it is also a reflection of minimal supply growth and a more social problem of persistent income inequality, two things unlikely to improve over the next couple of years. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Um, whether it's right or wrong, it is what it is, and that's happening. And as an investor, you guys need to understand that and put your money in the right places. I would still argue that class B and C are probably the places to be if you want to play a more hedge strategy. Although as an operator of 8,500 units, I will also say that it, it's not all smooth sailing month to month, right? You try and go into deals where there's adequate cash flow, but you have to protect the asset, which means having enough cash reserves. And if you have from a month to month basis, you're going to have higher months of vacancy, evictions, et cetera, than others. And this is why we're switching and focusing on a lot more developments in the future. We don't have to deal with all that tenants, toilets, and termites in a way. So he's gone full circle again. But I think you have to diversify your portfolio and all kinds of things and, um, you know, in, in the alternative investment world. And that comes up to the end, folks. So we're going to be doing the retreat in January 2020 and 23. So join the club to get first access to that. Simplepassivecashflow.com slash club. Those of you guys are in the family office group, the FOOM, you guys are going to get first crack at it. So if you guys are in that group, um, when we send you guys your checkout form, sign up for it as soon as possible because you guys get the best pricing and we try to hold slots for you guys. But after a while, we need to know what our headcount is. We need to know who's coming. If not, I'm going to get stressed out and we need to plan the activities for that three-day retreat here in Hawaii. That's going to be coming out probably after Halloween time. So you guys have some time. If you guys are new to the group, get on board. And if not, check out the book, simplepassivecashflow.com slash book. And I will see you guys next month. This website offers very general information concerning real estate for investment purposes. Every investor situation is unique. Always seek the services of licensed third-party appraisers and inspectors to verify the value and condition of any property you intend to purchase. Use the services of professional title and escrow companies and licensed tax, investment, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed as in every investment there is risk. The content found here is just my opinion and things change and I reserve the right to change my mind. Above all else, do your own analysis and think for yourself because in the end, you are the only person who is going to look out for your best interests.